Okay, welcome everybody. Attention, please. Attention, please. Welcome. Uh, I sent an email last Sunday, I think, or maybe Monday, because I saw on the website that there was no talk, no speaker yet. So I, um, I submitted a mail to uh, to Frank to uh, to ask if there was still room for a, for a talk. I've been working on uh, building my own compiler uh, the last couple of weeks, and uh, it might be interesting to share this knowledge that I uh, that I gained with you. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. A question that you can ask yourself, is this really interesting for PHP programmers? Because PHP is not the first language that you would think of when you start building a compiler, of course. Uh, I think it is. I think it is. We, we are all IT professionals, and as an IT professional, it is always good to, to have some knowledge of the tools that you're working with. It is good to know what's, what an operating system is. It's good to know what a disk is and what memory is. And it's also good to know what what the compiler is and how it works inside. Uh, that's what we, we do all day. We're all day, uh, every day we're programming, using programming languages, uh, turning these programming languages into other languages. It's good to know how they work inside. So it is, it is good knowledge to know, it's good to know something about, about compilers. And it also helps if you know how a language works. Hey, if, you, if you see a syntax error or if you see a type hinting error, if you see some, er some errors appear, it is good to know how the compiler works inside so that you know what is actually happening, what is causing this, this error. Uh, <coughs> but uh, a big, uh, uh, much better reason to, to know how to write compilers is because the, the techniques that, use, that are used by compilers to parse files, to, uh, to, to, to convert those files into trees, to convert uh, one language into another, that are technologies that are very useful for many other tasks as well. Every time that you're parsing some network protocol, or when you're parsing some CSS file, or when you're uh, uh, using regular expressions to, to find some matches in an HTML file, you could better use compiler technologies, to compiler techniques. They're much easier to work with. And one day you may have to write your own compiler, and if that's true, this is especially a good talk. What exactly is a compiler? I copy-pasted this definition from Wikipedia. And uh, the problem with definitions is, that's my personal problem, is they never make sense. And you never use them in real life. Eh? If, if you're going to explain someone, maybe a little child, what a cat is or what a cow is, you never come up with a formal definition. You just show a couple of images, tell this is a cat, that's a cat, and that's a cat, and that's a dog. And the human brain works in such a way that you can <coughs> find out that definition by yourself. But if you ask anyone, can you g please give me the definition of a cat, you will always get a wrong definition. Now, this is the official Wikipedia definition of a compiler. I don't know if it is true. It is, it's, a, it's a program that um, turns a programming language into some other computer language. Makes sense, but I think it is better to just have a look at a couple of examples. The most textbook-like example of a compiler is, of course, a C or a C++ compiler. That's what we think of first when you think about the compiler. You write something in one specific programming language, C or C++. You start the compiler, and the compiler turns your C++ source code into machine instructions. That's what a compiler is. Uh, the, the, dis the disadvantage of such a compiler is that the machine instructions only work on your specific machine. If you compile something on Ubuntu and you distribute it to a Macintosh, it stops working. Or when you send your 32-bit your file to a 64-bit uh, platform, it won't work. That's the disadvantage of a compiled uh, program. Uh, a slightly different approach is uh, used by Java. Java also is a compiled language, because after you've written a Java program, you need to pass it to the compiler, and uh, you have to turn it into something else. But Java does not turn it into machine instructions, but into some intermediate bytecode representation. And it is this bytecode that you're going to, to distribute. It's also a compiler, but a slightly different approach than, uh, well, a real compiler. P 
PHP is that a compiler. If you look at the formal definition, if I start a PHP script, it turns a programming language, PHP, <coughs> into some other computer language, namely a HTML file. So you could say, well, it is a compiler. It compiles my PHP source files into HTML. I don't think that's a very good uh, uh, definition of a compiler, but it matches the definition. But I, would, I wouldn't call PHP a compiled language. You, you run a PHP script, under the hood it is turned into some bytecode representation, so that if you run the same PHP file for two times or three times, the second and the third time that you run it, it is faster than the first time, but still, every time that you start a PHP file, it is first read into memory and uh, processed uh, by the interpreter. So it is a slightly different, uh, it's a very different approach. If we look at the JavaScript, well, in theory, there should not be much of a difference between JavaScript and PHP. They are both scripting languages, and the most important differences between JavaScript and PHP are the lack of dollar signs in JavaScript, and they have a different way of making uh, objects and classes. But in the end, they are both untyped languages with, uh, that are scripting languages that do not have to be compiled. You can just dis distribute your JavaScript or dis distribute your PHP code, and it runs on every machine. Still, if you make a comparison between a PHP script, especially one that you run on the Zend engine, and a JavaScript that you run with, for example, Node.js, and you have the same algorithm, you will find that the algorithm in JavaScript is much faster than the algorithm in PHP. Why would that be? Well, my, th my, th my idea is because JavaScript has been, has been improved so much more than PHP. There are many companies like uh, Google, like Microsoft, like Apple, big companies that are all doing their best to make JavaScript as fast as possible. So there's just large teams making improvements to JavaScript. And what they do is they evaluate your JavaScript and on the fly, they do not turn it into machine code, uh, into bytecode, but they turn it into machine code. So the JavaScript that are being executed on your browser are actually directly turned into machine code, which makes them much faster than a PHP script that's only turned into bytecode, which is not machine code. So JavaScript is faster than, uh, than PHP. But there is no theoretical reason why JavaScript should be fast. You can do the same with PHP. It's also a language with if statements, with functions, with classes. You can do exactly the same with PHP as you can with, um, uh, <coughs> with JavaScript. And this is actually what is now happening in the PHP world. Uh, Facebook has started its own PHP engine, HHVM, and they are doing exactly the same thing. They are also turning your PHP files into machine code. And uh, recently someone pr uh, has started a PHP NG uh, project, which is doing the same in the Zend engine. They are, turn they are not uh, converting your PHP scripts into bytecode, but into actual machine instructions, which is much faster. Uh, there is no real difference between uh, uh, compiled languages and uh, scripting languages. There are, of course, languages that are more famous for being a script language, like BASIC or uh, like PHP, but you can compile these languages too. There is no theoretical reason why that should not be possible to turn them into machine code. And there have also been uh, interpreters uh, created for languages that are traditionally more oriented as a, uh, a compiled language. Uh, there are interpreters for C and C++, for, uh, for example. But despite the fact that both languages, that both type of languages are more or less similar or logically similar, uh, there are in practice differences. Maybe you know these differences yourself. Uh, for example, uh, compiled languages tend to be faster. This is not always necessarily true, but in general, they tend to be faster. Uh, a good reason to compile, to use a compiled language is because you can keep the source private for yourself, so you don't have to distribute the source. If you want to make a closed source application in JavaScript, you have, well, that's tough. If you want to make a closed source application in C++, that's much easier because you don't have to distribute the source to make your application work. Uh, they're easier to, deb to debug, for example, uh, if you, make a change your PHP uh, program, you just have to press F5 to see if the change did what it, what it was supposed to do. And with a C++ application, you have to recompile the entire application to see if it now star starts working. There are differences, and if I think if you 
do your best, you can think of 5% more differences between compiled and interpreted languages. What I just mentioned about JIT, it is hot these days. You hear more and more about it, and many languages are being turned into JIT languages. And uh, a JIT means uh, just in time, and the moment uh, uh, a script is first read, at the moment a source file is read, it is immediately turned into machine instructions that can directly be executed by the CPU, which is much faster than processing all the instructions uh, individually. Uh, it is, uh, in, in fact, it is even possible to have better performance using just-in-time comp uh, compilation than it is to have a compiled language. Because, well, you, you can create uh, examples. If you have an if statement in a compile statement but, and you know at compile time already that it is never going to be executed because today it is not Christmas, you can leave out that whole branch from from your compiled, from your machine instructions, but with the compiled language you cannot do that because maybe in some specific places, some specific time, this is going to happen. You can make optimizations with JITs that you cannot do with compiled languages. So it can even be, be faster. JIT technologies are used by, by all the compilers to, to, to compile uh, CSS style sheets, to compile JavaScript, and they're also used by script languages now like HTML for PHP and PHP NG for the original, traditional PHP. Do we have any questions so far? Yes. It's a good question. If you do it right, there, is no, there are no security consequences, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think it is more dangerous if you if you just if you have the ability to 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 change to 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 put some bytes in the memory than it is with an intermediate language because it is always interpreted and you can run in a sandbox and with machine code you always run directly on the CPU. No, it is it's a, it's a good. I think it is more dangerous to to run machine code. Well, you don't want to virtual machine. Yeah, I, I do not know enough about hardware, but maybe even in hardware environments, you can use sandboxing. That you can can tell the the CPU because the CPU nowadays they are so powerful. You can set up all sorts of constraints on running the inst the instructions. But I think it is more dangerous to to run direct machine code than it is to run bytecode. But on the other hand, if you run bytecode, you have this large program that's actually running the bytecode. So there are many more reasons for mistakes in, the, in that program. So more? Let's start writing a compiler. I've decided to do use a very simple language for this, Smarty. Are we all familiar with Smarty? Well, OK, everyone is. That's, a, that's good. Smart is a very simple uh, templating language. You can make HTML files, and inside the HTML files, you can put variables and if statements and many more things. But for the example, we just stick with using variables and, and if statements. That will be uh, complicated uh, enough. This is an example of Smarty template file. This is how you would normally use it from PHP. You create a Smarty object, you assign your variables, and you display a template. Straightforward. What happens under the hood, Smarty turns this, this template file <coughs> into a PHP file. And this PHP file is then executed by Smarty, or run by Smarty. In other words, Smarty turns one programming language into some other programming language, so you could call Smarty a compiler if you insist. Uh, this is then the, the, the example PHP file that Smarty turns the original template into. If you scroll down, you can see the actual code. Here is what is happening. How can we improve this algorithm? <coughs> well, if you think of it, Smarty is a PHP script that turns a template file, a CPL file, into a PHP file. There are two obvious places how you can improve this. 
for a start, you, can, you should not turn this T TPL file into a PHP file, but you should turn it into machine instructions directly. That's much faster than having this PHP file. And the other thing how you can improve this, not by making smartly a PHP script, but by making smartly a native algorithm, an algorithm implemented in a native language like C or like C++, that would also be much faster. And a cool side effect of these steps is that you can use uh, Smarty also inside non-PHP objects, because nowadays if you want to use a Smarty template in a project, it must be a PHP project, because you must have to start with Smarty object, but it's a PHP object, so it only works in PHP environments. In fact, what I now present here as a cool side effect was the main reason for me to start working on this, because I have many customers that use Smarty template, and I want to speed up the, these applications, and I want to uh, to, r to run the mailings with, uh, with C++ code without having all my customers to make changes to their Smarty templates. So I had to process these Smarty templates with, P with C++ code. If you look at a compiler, a compiler is essentially very simple. What a compiler first does is it, is it takes a tokenizer and it splits the input string in tokens into an if statement, into an identifier, into a literal string, into a literal uh, integer, just like you would do yourself. If, if you see yourself uh, a source file, you immediately discover, oh, that's a function, that's an if statement, that's an identifier. You immediately do it like that. And only in the second step, you are going to parse it. You're going to look, oh, but I see I've opened a curly brace there, but it doesn't close. Oh, I see that I have an else statement before the if statement. That makes no sense. But that's the second step. That's the parser. And that parser, that creates a syntax tree. The, all these statements and all the elements are turned into one big tree that represents your entire application or your entire algorithm. And if you have that syntax tree, you can use that syntax tree to do something with. For example, turn that syntax tree into some other representation, like machine instructions, or like bytecode, or like another PHP script, like Smarty is doing. Okay, let's take a look at the tokenizer. If you take a look at our first uh, very simple example template, you can see the tokens. There are raw tokens. For example, the, 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 the raw text, uh, the, the HTML, the body, the hello world, the, the, the exclamation mark. But there are also tokens that start a different, so di a different syntax, like the opening dollar sign, the opening if sign, the, the closing if sign. And if you are inside the if statement, you can recognize tokens like the h variable, the bigger than sign, the, li the literal integer 18. These are other tokens. And there are n tokens to close the smarty context, the, the closed and curly brace. This is your st first step in your compiler. The first, thing, the first thing that you have to do when you write a compiler is writing a tokenizer, writing a function that takes this input and generates all these tokens. <coughs> this is what I just saw. Uh, the, the, the tokenizer can hold state information because uh, 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 the H variable inside the curly brace is a token, but would the same H variable be used inside the raw text, it would not be a token, so it can, it can keep state information. And the cool thing about compiler writing is that there are already tools available to do this for you. You may have heard of the flex tool or the lex tool, which is a tool that actually creates a tokenizer for you. So you don't have to write this tokenizer yourself, you just have to create a file in which you describe all the tokens that you recognize in your source file. You give this file with all the token descriptions to flex and flex creates for you a C function that recognizes exactly these tokens. For example, if you take a look at, uh, at Smarty, or a very simple and trivial subset of Smarty, this would be the tokenizer. We recognize the if opening token, we recognize the dollar sign opening token, we recognize the end token, and we recognize an opening curly brace. When we are in the 
global context. And the moment we move into uh, smarty context, we change the, the state, we say begin inside girly braces, and from that, from that moment on, we recognize other structures. You see many tokens here, all, the, all those token underscore something uh, things that are constant, that are they have values like one, two, three, four, five, in other parts of the program, you can pick up those values and know exactly what token you encounter. Some tokens like uh, the regular expression for, uh, for uh, numeric values have some additional statements that are executed to remember exactly what specific uh, literal value there was used. And this is it. This is a very simple file that just a couple of regular expressions describing all the tokens. And inside strings is also a different context because we have to uh, look for the, the closing quotes and inside the string you can use uh, dollar signs and all things that would otherwise be tokens. It is, it's a relatively simple file in which you describe just the tokens that you recognize in your language. You put this file into some, well, in a, into a compiler. You can compile it with flex and then the file that you put your, uh, your, your token definitions in. And this creates a tokenized .c file, which you can then compile with the uh, normal C compiler. And once you did that, you have automatically this yylex function that you can call to fetch the next token. You can, in a while loop, you just you just keep calling it, well, tell me what's the next token, and you can see, oh, well, I now have an if, and this is an identifier, this is a numeric, this is a, an ant if. You get all these tokens, and then you do something with the token. And that's the next step. That's the next step in building your own compiler. You have to parse the token. You're going to create a syntax tree based on all those tokens. You're, make, you're going to create a program object which has a list of statements, and the statement can, for example, be an if statement, which has <coughs> one branch with a true uh, branch and one branch with a, with a false branch. You're going to create this tree. And you have to do operator preference. If you, if you see a, a list of tokens, if you see first see a literal two, then a plus, then a literal three, then a, a multiplication sign, then a literal four, you have to know that you first have to multiply three by four and then add two. You have to know that. That's what your parser is going to do. In fact, building the parser is more difficult than building the tokenizer because the tokenizer is really simple. It was just a list of regular expressions. But still, writing a parser, uh, you would, for example, create a tree like this. Uh, the, the, the template that we originally saw can be turned into a tree like this with HTML body, then an if statement, then slash body, then slash HTML, and the if statement is built out of uh, an expression which is a bigger than expression with a variable age compared to a literal 18. And then the yes tree does output the image and the no tree, well, it does nothing. There was no else in the if statement. Writing this, this parser is more complex than writing the first, the initial tokenizer. But still it is relatively simple because we have also tools for that. Just like we had uh, a, g a generator, to uh, uh, the flex tool to create the tokenizer, we have a couple of tools that you can use to create the parser. For example, yuck, which I always find a very amusing tool because it means yet another compiler compiler, which sounds very cool because it's, uh, it's very technolog uh, technological. I like this word, but it is closed source or it's, it's you cannot use it. And there's bison, which is an alternative for that. And there's lemon, which is another alternative and part of the SQLite. Well, it sounds very, very silly, but the tool that is part of the SQLite suit is in fact the best one to use. And what it, what it does in the, uh, in the second line, it reads a formal context-free grammar description and based on that grammar description, it creates a C file in which a function is defined that does exactly parse that language defined by that grammar. Okay, <coughs> what exactly is a grammar? I googled the definition from Wikipedia. It is a set of production rules for strings 
in a formal language. The rules describe how to form strings from the language alphabet. The language alphabets are the tokens that you defined in the first set, so that's the if statement, the identifiers, that's the alphabet, uh, that are valid according to the language's syntax. A grammar does not describe the meaning of the strings or what can be done with uh, them in whatever context, only their form. So it means a grammar defines what an if statement looks like, but it doesn't define what an if statement does. But in computer science, we use not grammars, we use a special form of grammars, namely context-free grammars. Okay, what is a context-free grammar? A context-free grammar is uh, a grammar in which every production rule is of the form, so it's called fe spelled way, where fe is a single non-terminal symbol Okay, so it's a single non-terminal symbol, and W is a string of terminals and or non-terminals, which can be empty. Okay, okay. This is like the cat. It is very difficult to give a definition and for someone to understand it. You can better give an image of it, and people will understand what the cat is if you show a couple of images. Well, this is the grammar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is an example of a grammar. This is the example of a grammar of an insert statement in, an, in, in SQL. Uh, you can see a grammar is, what's an insert statement? Well, an insert statement is first the, the keyword insert or the keyword replace or the keyword insert or fail into, well, with an optional database name because you can skip it, and then a dot with a table name, which is required, but no way to skip it, then uh, an opening bracket with a number of columns, or you can skip that, closing bracket if you have an opening bracket, etc. You get the ID. This is what the grammar is. And if you have uh, 10 of these uh, rules, you have the full grammar of what SQL should, should look like. There are other ways to describe an, uh, a grammar. For example, we use it by using extended Becker's nor form. I thought it was uh, it meant normal form, but I looked it up on Wikipedia. It turns out to be Becker's nor form. Okay, this is also a grammar. I think when you look on the internet, you, you find these things. If you look, uh, what should my uh, style sheet look like, or what should uh, my, 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 state, my, my query look like, you will run into things like this that are describing what is a valid syntax. Uh, based on this, this grammar, for example, this is just an example grammar, you can pro uh, write a program that looks like this. The grammar specifies what a valid input would be, and this is a valid input according to this grammar. Doesn't matter, this is an example of a grammar. How cool would it be if we could just have a grammar, give that to our compiler compiler, and that the compiler compiler automatically turns that into a C function that creates a tree from any input tokens that you give to it? Yes, of course. Oh, that is a very difficult question. I was so much hoping that you would not ask that. Um, Context-free means that um, in your grammar, the left side of your grammar, the left side is here, an insert statement is, and then you have this full list. And if the left side is just one, uh, one token, an insert statement, it is considered context-free. Hmm? Yeah, do we have a context when we are, a natural language is not context-free, but computer languages normally are. Uh, very well, very good.
Again? From the from the insert statement. Yes. This is this is this is just the, the, the rule for the insert statement. The delete stress statement has a completely different rule. For it now, for this, if you if you would give a delete statement to this rule, it would say no. This is not a delete statement because it doesn't start with insert. That's the grammar, and but the full grammar of SQL also includes delete statement and select statement. And this is all context free. This is all context free because the left side of the rule just says an insert statement is, and then the context full is. It would be a, it would be an, uh, uh, a context full language the if you. It would be context full if you if you cannot have rules in which you say an insert statement followed by a delete statement looks like this. If you if you have rules in which there are two terminals on the left side, then you would have a context full. But this is all very theoretical <laughs> computer <laughs> science, and uh, how we can prove that one language is identical to another, or how we can prove that one language can be implemented or cannot be implemented. In reality, any programming language can be defined as a context free grammar. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> But what I said, this is all theoretical. Just take a look at the images. This is a grammar. And how cool would it be if we can just pass that grammar to a tool that then turns this grammar into some C function that <coughs> recognizes this grammar? And in fact, this tool exists, which is called Lemon or Yuck or Bison or uh, one of these others. Let's see how we did that for Smarty. You start your lemon file by defining the preference of your operators. You can say, okay, uh, the or operator, I believe that the, the, the one on the top is the, uh, the one with the, with the lowest priority, and the one at the bottom are the, the most important ones. So an or operator has less priority than uh, a plus, for example, and has less pri priority than uh, uh, brackets. And you create a series of statements. What is a template, in fact? Well, in template is, you start with start, a template is a list of statements. What is a list of statements? Well, a list of statements is a list of statements followed by one statement. Okay. Or a list of statements is just one statement. You have to stop somewhere. What is a statement? Well, a statement can, for example, be an if statement. Or a statement can be raw output, HTML, uh, body. Or a statement can be an expression, which is, means a dollar sign followed by some expression, dollar, dollar sign H, dollar sign name. And it is split up. You have this set of rules, just like you had the image 
explaining what uh, the lead uh, query was, or what the insert query was, you can have this list of rules explaining what your grammar should look like. And you pass this list of rules to the Lemon program to turn this list of rules into a C function. It does it all automatically. And for every rule, you create a line of code saying what should happen to your program or to your tree when such a rule is encountered. And for example, when the if statement is encountered, it creates a new if statement object holding the expression inside it and the actual statement to execute inside that statement. When a less than operator is encountered, it creates a binary less operator object inside your syntax tree. And this is all that you have to do. You create all those simple, those, those simple lines explaining your grammar. This is the heart of your parsing algorithm. And of course, you will have to implement all these classes. But these classes are really straightforward classes, holding an, an expression object, and holding a left side and a right side. They're straightforward classes. Okay, you put this in a file, you can compile this file with the, with the command lemon, and you can then compile the C file, and from that moment on, you can use the parse function, that's the function that was created by this lemon process, to start processing tokens. So what we have, we have, uh, from the tokenizer, we have this first yylex function, and from uh, the parser, we have this allocation function, and then a function to process all your tokens. I have simplified it, of course, because this is just a talk. We are not going into the depth of it. But there are some extra parameters to pass to it. But this is the core of your compiler, more especially of your building a syntax tree. And once you have parsed your entire file, you have a syntax tree. You have a tree with all these objects in it. This was the tree. We now have it in source code. What can we do with this tree? Well, we can start optimizing it. Once you have compiled this tree, when you, once you have this, this tree in memory, you can detect, oh, I see two branches, they are, uh, they are adding two plus, plus two, well, I replace it with just the number four. You can optimize it, of course. But after you've optimized it, what, what, what more can you do with it? Well, imagine that you're writing, you're building a smart invalidator. Well, then you're ready, because that's all what the validator do, does check if it is valid. Well, it is valid because you have this tree. Otherwise, you would have run into a syntax error. So with a, for a smarty uh, uh, validator, you're ready. But imagine that you want to create a smarty mini file or a smarty pretty file. You can give every node in your tree a function, okay, generate output or generate yourself, but then minify it or pretty it. So we, by adding this special method to every method, to every class, to every object, you can have a smarty minifier. Or you can make a smarty interpreter. If you just create an execute function on every object, uh, the, the, the HTML output function, well, what it does, well, it, it outputs the word HTML. What does the if statement? Well, it evaluates the bigger than expression, and then it outputs the yes branch or no branch. You create a smarty evaluator or a smart interpreter. Imagine that you want to create the same PHP script that smart originally does. So you can do that too, because you have the same tree, you can create the PHP code on the fly. Or what to do if you want to create a real compiler and want to create machine instructions, because that's what you want to do if you are building a real compiler. That's the final step. And this is, in fact, the hardest step. Yes, we have, we have now, we, we are now able, by doing all these relatively simple steps, we are now able to parse an input file into this syntax tree holding all the if statements, all the exp uh, output, all the expressions. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm asking, uh, do you write the execution of the prettifier? No, I didn't do that. Okay. No, I was, <coughs> because we're not writing a prettifier here. No. We, are <laughs> we, we are doing, we are trying to, to write a compiler here. 
And this is the difficult part because now we have to actually create machine instructions and creating machine instructions, that is no fun. I don't know if anyone has done it. I did it during my study times and it only took one week or so and then no one wanted to, to give that course so it was just a small course. Okay, okay, you, okay you, you know how to, okay. Move on to writing just normal programming languages, please. So no one likes doing that. It is difficult to maintain. It's almost impossible to, to, to read or to write. There's not much documentation about it. It's difficult. What would be an intermediate approach? What you sometimes see is that compilers first generate, turn this tree into a C tree, into a C program. That's easier to compile. You, you just turn your syntax tree into a C program, and then you pass this to the C compiler, which turns it into machine instructions. It's much easier than generating machine code. But it is slow. Imagine. You first parse the template file, the Smarty file, into a syntax tree then you turn the syntax tree into a C file, which is of course doable. Then you start up the C, f the, the C compiler, which reads that file, starts up a tokenizer, and the parser builds a big syntax tree, but you already have the syntax tree, well the C compiler does it again, and uh, will then turn this syntax tree into machine code, which it will store on disk, thank you, then you read it from disk, and then you put it in memory, and then you can execute it. It is much slower, it takes you maybe 0.001 second extra time, which is a waste. Well, it doesn't matter, of course, but this is more fun. How much <laughs> fun? <laughs> it would be much more fun to generate the machine code right away and to put it directly in memory and not first to disk. You have this tree, turn it into machine code right away. That would be the coolest part. How can we do that? Well, today we are so <coughs> lucky and happy because nowadays we no longer have to write machine code ourselves. There are a couple of libraries for us that simplify our life. For example, LLVM, which is the backend of the C Lang compiler, offers a very good library that you can use to create machine code. And Mozilla, the browser, also created a library to turn trees into machine code. And there is a very simple open source libgit library that also gives a, t a library to turn, uh, to create machine code. And the cool thing is these libraries are platform independent, so you can just add, want an add instruction, a function instruction, a branch instruction, and they turn it into some machine code. So you don't have to worry about writing all these hard parts any longer. And they even optimize the code for you, so it's very powerful. We use libgit. Well, I did. I use that. It is probably the worst one of all. <laughs> but it is the only one that has some documentation and it is simple to start with. So I think LLVM is the best one because it is backed by, by large companies and uh, it's a very large open source project and it, is, it, has fr it has a lot of features, but Libgit is so simple. It has one very simple website. You can read it and you have, I think, hundred functions or so, which are all well documented, and you can turn a syntax tree into machine code. It's very simple to work with. And this is what it does. This is an example of the if statement. You don't have functions in machine code, you just have labels. You can say jump to this special label or jump to that special label. We create two labels, right after the if statement and to the else statement. We first do an evaluation, if that is correct, we just continue processing instructions. Otherwise, we jump to the else. And after processing the instructions, we stop uh, and we jump to the end. That's what's happening here. It's, very, it's one of the most complicated functions that you can implement, the if statement. But still, it is very simple. This is all what it takes to write machine code. And after you wrote the machine code, you can execute it. Remember, this was the syntax tree, and every node has a function to turn that node into machine instructions using libgit. And after you did that, you can run a program, run a smarty template file with C++. You just create a data object in which you store all the variables. You create the template object, and you process it based on that specific data. 
This is about 10 times faster than uh, doing the same thing in PHP with smarties. Still, smarties is very fast. If, if you just show John Doe on your front, so it took an iteration of 100,000 times to measure this improvement. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we're doing it for fun. Um, we can turn, of course, this C++ extension into a PHP extension, so you can use the same inside PHP, and you have much faster uh, smarty template processing in, uh, uh, in PHP 2. Um, we have added some extra gimmicks. For example, if you have a template file, you can turn your template file into a shared object file with uh, a special compiler because we have the syntax file, this is the syntax tree anyway, so let's turn it into machine code and store it on disk. So the next time that you call uh, your, your, your template, we can call the shared object file which already holds the compiled template as well. The funny thing is this does, this is not even that much faster than using legit. Which was surprising to me. I expected this to be much faster because you don't have to parse it anymore, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, this is uh, the summary. The, the main idea is that uh, writing a compiler or writing a parser is not even that difficult. The tools that you have for tokenizing and parsing, they're all here. You can use them. Uh, the tools, uh, Flex, Lemon, Libgit, LLVM, are not so difficult to use. You can use them if you ever need to write a, a, a parser for a network protocol or for a style sheet or for an HTML file. You can easily use these tools. They are not difficult to use. And also, don't be afraid to switch to a new language. It is easy to combine PHP with these technologies. It was not hard for me. Okay, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes. <coughs> 